Welcome. I'm Mike Holt with Mike Holt Enterprises. And right off the bat, I'm going to have to do a little apologizing. We had a little bit of a problem technically at our end here. The computer we're using, it died. So the video feed that we were going to connect from my laptop and the NEC is not available. Also, the bandwidth, we have not been able to upload the larger bandwidth, so it, you might notice a little bit of a jitter in the motion. So we apologize for that. This is our first official Facebook show, and I hope that you enjoy it. Now, you will be able to, now, Belinda, can you tell them how they can uh, post questions to us as we're moving along? Right on Facebook, they can click on My Cold Live Video Show. At the very bottom, they'll see an area where they can post questions. It says, discuss this event. They can share it, and they'll post right there. Okay. You already got a nice smile, so there we go. All right. <laughs> Small problem we also had because the laptop died is the audio feed that I would have used in Belinda's audio feed. Belinda is the uh, Chief Operations Officer for Michael's Enterprises. Go to michael.com, go to contacts, and you can see who Belinda is, and you can even contact if you want to. All right. We only have about 30 minutes, and as you are interacting with me, you can ask some questions as we go along, and we'll try to see what we can do. We had some questions submitted to us, and I'm gonna just take one question at a time. If you submitted other questions, I might not be able to get to them. First question that came up was dealing with Section 517, or actually Article 517 of the NEC, having to do with dental offices. Are hospital-grade receptacles required to be installed in a dental office? And I'm so frustrated that we don't have the interaction with the video because I, you'd be able to see the question, and then I'd pop up the code book, and I would show you the code book, on that. So all I can do right now is if you have a code book, if you go to page 447 of the code book, if you take a look at 517.18b, and that's what I'm going to do, go to page 447. And you're working off the 2011 code? And I'm, yeah, good question. I'm working off the 2011 code. And here's what it says. That's 517.18b on the question about hospital grade receptacles. 517B, I'm sorry, 517-18B. Each patient bed location shall be provided with a minimum of four receptacles. They shall be permitted to be of the single duplex or quadruplex type or any combination of the three. All receptacles, whether four or more, shall be listed as hospital grade. So when you have a patient bed location, and a patient bed location is identified in 517.2, so that would be like a hospital. So if you're in a hospital, then you need to have a minimum number of receptacles, and I tell you about it, four receptacles can be single receptacles, duplex receptacles, or quad receptacles, and those receptacles would have to be hospital grade. So answering the question, in a dental office or a chiropractor office or any other type of medical facility, or in those type of facilities, let's just say dental office is a chiropractor, do you need hospital grade receptacles? The answer is no. And if anybody, if you're watching this, if you have any additional questions, then we can uh, pick those up as we go along. All right, next question. How often, uh, the question is, Mike, I, I use your books and I see that you always use the 75 degree C column of table 31015B16 when you size the conductors, even though your examples might be less than 100 amperes. Doesn't 11014C1 tell us to size the conductors at the 6 degree C terminals. If you look at the beginning of all our textbooks, we put conditions in there. We say, listen, this book is assuming the following issues. And one of the things that we identify in the beginning of the front matter is that we assume it's all examples are to be single phase unless identified as three phase. We assume all conductors to be copper unless identified as aluminum. And we also assume all terminals are rated 75 degrees C in all cases. Now, in reality, are all terminals rated 75 degrees C? Probably they are. So therefore, we use 75 degrees C in the practical terms. Then why does the code have 60 degrees C opacities? And why does the rule say 110.14C1 to use a 60 degree C? Because in the past, we're talking about 20 years ago or so, terminals for 100 amperes or less were rated 60 degrees C traditionally. Above 100 amperes, they were rated for 75. So in practical terms, you go to table 310, 15, B16 to size your conductors. The first thing you're going to do is size your conductors based upon the 75 degrees C column. 
not the 60 degree C column if it's under 100 amperes. Now, when you get the conductor opacity, we're going to use the 90 degree C column because we traditionally use THHN. So, the code page is page 39. That section is 11014C1, which is a rule about 60 degrees C. And there's also a reference in there that if equipment is rated for 75 degrees C under 100 amperes, then you can use the 75 degrees C column for conductor sizing. Linda, do we get any questions? Any comments? No. Listen, if you're on a computer and you're watching this and you want to just kind of give us a little feedback and let us know that we're there, that you're there, appreciate that. Okay. Next question. What determines when and where bonding and grounding, bonding and grounding bushings are used? There's two locations in the code as it relates to bonding. Actually, there's a little bit more than that, but the general requirements is going to be for services, and that would be your code book page 120, and that rule is 25092. Now, you have to understand what electrical service is, so you'd have to go to Article 100, read the definition of what a service is. That's from the utility itself, the electric utility. That would be your electrical service. And service conductors end at the main means of cutoff, which is your surface equipment. That's Article 100 defines what your service equipment is, your main means of cutoff. Once you leave your service disconnect, which has overcurrent protection, then those are feeders. Any service conductor that's installed in a raceway or an enclosure is gonna to have to comply with some special bonding requirements, and that rule is on page 120 of the code book, 250.92. Now, when you get into feeders and branch circuits, bonding bushings and bonding jumpers are generally not required, but there's another rule that talks about this, and that's going to be page 121, and that section is 250.97. And that specific rule says that anytime you have 277 or 480 volt circuits, and you're installing those raceways where there is concentric or incentric knockouts remaining. So if you have your ring knockouts remaining, those ring knockouts are not identified at the listing agency to carry fault current in general applications. Now, you'll see your four square boxes or your, what you might call them uh, four by four boxes or your 1900 box, whatever you might call them, just your regular outlet boxes. You'll see those where they have a half inch and then there'll be like a half a moon or a crescent around that to give you a three quarter inch. Those are not knockouts. I'll call those punch outs. Those are serious. And if you take a look at those, those outlet boxes, metal outlet boxes, if you look at the carton that comes with them, the carton will be identified on it and it will tell you that these boxes are identified for bonding 277 and 40 volt circuits in accord with 250.97. So, if you're running 277 and 40 volt circuits, 250.97 says you're gonna to need to have bonding bushings and bonding jumpers anytime they're in the raceway is terminating in concentric or incentric knockouts. There's an exception to that, saying that if the enclosure is specifically listed for that application, then bonding bushings and bonding jumpers are not required. And we talked about that exception, that would be your regular uh, metal outlet boxes that you're gonna be using there. Wasn't planning on covering this, but I'll just kind of mention real quick. 250.100 talks about hazardous classified locations. You have 501, 502, 503, and that would be 50130, 50230, and 50330, which talks about the bonding requirements for raceways and hazard classified locations that complies with 250.100 which requires us to comply with 250.92. Melinda? Well, we have a question. Would that also apply to a 480 volt service? Well, if it's a service, meaning you have service conductors and you have a raceway that has service conductors, then we're gonna have to comply with 250.92 bonding. Then probably you can use bonding lockers. The best way is to use bonding lockers, not bonding bushes and a bonded jumper. But once you get past that part, you get into feeders and branch circuits then 480 volt circuits or 277 or 277 480. In other words, if it's over 250 volts of ground, then for feeders and branch circuits, you're gonna to have to provide 250-92 bonding in accordance with 250-97 rules. If it's hazard classified locations, 250-100, referencing 50-130, 50-230, 50-330, 
is also going to have to comply with 250-92 bonding requirements, but you just can't use the neutral for bonding. And I know this is a lot of stuff, so hopefully, are we going to be archiving this, Brian? Yes. All right. We're going to archive this, and what I suggest you do, and you'll be getting a newsletter, is kind of get your codebook out. And, and read those rules and details and then watch this tape and come back because I'm just trying to give you something that you don't have to be taking notes or take notes. 25092, 25097, 25100, 50130, 50230, 50230. Does this apply to feeders only? No, it has to do with conductors. It doesn't matter if it's a feeder, that's what I said. If it's a service raceway, 25092 applies. If it's a feeder or a branch circuit, and if it's over 250 volts of ground, which is 277, 480, then it applies to branch circuits or feeders only when the raceways, the metal raceways, are inserting into a metal enclosure where there's ring knockouts remaining. We have another question from Romeo. In a PV, Romeo, question. In a PV system using microinverters, does the GEC need to attach to each inverter, or can listed fishing, fittings, washers qualify if used to attach the inverter to the mounting frame. Question is on, on PV systems, solar voltaic systems, 690. 690. Oh, we're probably talking about 690, 43, 45, 47. The question when you have microinverters, are you required to run a grounding electrode conductor from each microinverter back over to the grounding electrode system in accordance with 690.47? Electrically, Romeo, the answer is no. There's no reason to. Those microinverters are connected by those uh, weave connectors that are specifically designed to bond the metal enclosure of the microinverter over to the rack of that particular microinverter. That rack is connected to an equipment grounding conductor, which is going to be brought back ultimately to the service, which is going to be connected to the grounding electrode system. So electrically, Romeo, there is no reason to be running a separate grounding electrode conductor. But let's talk about the code. The current code, 2008, as well as 2011 code, basically says when you have utility and microinverter, just when you have an inverter, utility interactive inverter, that that is required to be grounded. Now, whether it's a 5kW or a 10kW or whether it's going to be a 300 watt or be a, say that'd be in, that'd be in VA, it's probably 300 VA or be a 300 watt, they're going to have to be connected to a grounding electrode conductor. So, technically, according to the code, yes, you are going to have to run a grounding electric conductor from each microinverter. Now, I understand that these microinverters are being revised now, and they're now coming with an equipment grounding conductor. And, and it's, that, it's possible that the instructions of microinverters in the future will make it clear that we do not have to have a grounding electric conductor to it. Electrically, Romeo, there is no reason to be doing this. This is insane. Code-wise, it really is required. Sorry. Any other questions on that, Belinda? Hang it. Not on that one. All right. We're, we're going to go to another question. If you have a question posted, if not, I'm going to go with my canned questions. And I might run out of questions before you run out of questions. And I have to say goodbye. So don't run out of questions. All right. Here we go. What requirements must be met to mount utility interactive inverters in a non-readily accessible location. Romeo, answer you. Microinverters are the utility interactive inverters, and if they're up on the roof and they're under the panel, man, they're not at a readily accessible location. We'd have to go to page 602 of the code book, and that rule is 690.14D. So let me just jump over there, page 602. 690.14, where is it at? 690.14D. I apologize that you can't uh, see what I'm seeing. It was designed that way. All right, here we go. Four, okay, here we go. 690.14D says this, utility interactive mounted in a non-readily accessible location. And that could be microinverters or it could just simply be a typical inverter like SMA or any other manufacturers that have, you know, centralized type of inverters. Utility interactive inverters shall be permitted to be mounted on roofs or other exterior surface or other exterior areas that are not readily accessible. These installations are complied with one through four, 690.14D1 through four. 
Number one, a direct current photovoltaic disconnected mean shall be mounted within sight of or in the inverter. So it's gonna to have to have a disconnecting means. An alternate current disconnecting means shall be mounted within sight of or in the inverter. So if we had like a, a 5 kW inverter and it's not really accessible, then we need to have a DC disconnecting means and an AC disconnecting means. They're gonna to have to be within sight of or in the inverter themselves. Number three, the alternate current output conductors from the inverter and an additional alternate current disconnecting means for the inverter shall comply with 69014C1 and that's where you have to have a disconnecting means to be readily accessible. So if you put an inverter up on a roof, 5 kW inverter where it's not readily accessible, you need a, a disconnect, a DC disconnect, an AC disconnect with inside of that equipment. And in addition to that, you're gonna have to have a disconnecting means that is readily accessible for the AC output conductors. And then the last thing is a plaque. Has to be installed in accordance with 705.12. That is that, you, you know, we don't know there's a diverter in there, and so where you have the other services or the other systems, and you have a DC system, you need to have an AC system disconnecting means and for the building, and then you have to have a PV system AC disconnecting means. We need to be, make sure that we put a plaque at each location saying, hey, listen, there's a PVC system here located over there, and identifying that according to 705.12. Any questions, Belinda? Not at this time. Not at this time. All right. Oh, here we go. Oh. This is, uh, they're looking for, all their texts carry iPads. They're trying to find an electrical code book that they can download via PDF so the guys can view them at all times. Well, you can go to nfpa.org and you can download the PDF version of the code book. And that should have, I, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that if you go to nfpa.org and you download the electronic version of the code book, uh, you should have no problem there at all. You'll be fine. All right, next question. In referencing the 250.66, that's a rule dealing with the sizing of the grounding electroconductors for AC systems. The, the reference says this, of 250.66 dealing with ground rods. If I drive ground rods, 250.66A, yeah, 250.66A says that the largest conductor that's required to that driven ground rod is six gauge wire. And the question is, it says it doesn't have to be large than 6 gauge wire if it's the sole connection. And the question is, what does that mean by a sole connection? And because I don't have the ability to show you video or be able to interact to you more like I'd like it to, but we'll do that for the next time, I'll have to just try to help you understand this. Imagine a single conductor coming off of the service or whatever the, the ground the electric conductor is coming from. That conductor is going to a ground rod. In the event of a ground fault, fault current is not trying to get to the earth. It's not trying to go to ground. Fault current leaving a power supply is going back over to the source. However, since your source is a grounded system, talking about grounded systems, because I assume everything is grounded unless we talk otherwise, since the source is grounded the earth at, let's say, the utility point, and your electrical system is grounded at the building and it's connected to the earth, anytime that there's gonna be a ground fault, the fault current is going to be primarily flowing back to the source via the equipment grounding conductor or the effective ground fault current path as identified at 250.2. But there is an, an alternate path at the same time because the system is grounded, the service is grounded, and if you're using a ground rod only, and let's just say the ground rod could get 25 ohms, not like it, but if it did get 25 ohms, during the moment of a fault, Fault current is traveling to the source and all the possible paths, not the low resistive path, all the possible paths. So it's gonna travel on the effective ground fault current path and then it's gonna travel through the earth between the two electrodes. The amount of current traveling to the earth can be calculated. If you have a 25 ohm ground and you have a 120 volt fault, Ohm's law is I, intensity, amperes, is equal to E, electromotive force, the pressure, the pushing, which is the voltage, over the R, which is the opposition to the current flow, the resistance. We're not gonna worry about impedance. So I is equal to E over R, what's over R, what's the voltage, 120, 25. So take 120 divided by 25, it's 4.8 amps. 
So for every ground rod, we run a single conductor to it. We have electrical service. The system is grounded under a fault condition. In that case, the maximum fault current is 4.8 amps if it's the sole connection. So since it's a sole connection and we're grounding, and the purpose of grounding is not to clear a fault, not to bring everything to the same potential. The purpose of grounding is, I'm sorry, is simply to stabilize that system voltage. Is is whenever there's a lightning event outside or some kind of capacitive charge because of restriking ground fault that we're able to get that 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 extra energy that's charged up with that system to discharge it. It's not the clear fault. So six gauge wire on a ground rod according to two fifty sixty six A is fine. But why does the code say the sole connection? Well, because if that's the only wire that goes to the earth, well then no amount of current more than the amount that could be possibly driven through because of voltage, which is going to be in the, in the small amount of amperes. So what happens if I took that grounding electric conductor and I went to a water pipe and then I go over to a ground rod? Well, that grounding electric conductor is not the sole connection to that electrode. Now there's an alternate path. And once that conductor could, and once you go to the water pipe, and that water pipe might be connected, let's say, to some electrical equipment, now in the event of a fall current, that fall current would be substantial. So you run a single conductor to a ground rod, nothing else, 250-66A, six gauge wire is the largest. Once you go to more than one point, you gotta have to go to table 250-66. Okay. Oh, we got we got a few more, so hold on one okay. second. It said, can you help please clarify? Oh, the OSHA, the OSHA question. Yeah. I'm not an expert in OSHA, so I can't even address it, other than to tell you that OSHA adopts NFPA 7E, which I think is a workplace safety, work practice, like that. So that would be somebody, go to mycole.com, go under find an expert, and under the experts, there are people listed in there that, that teach OSHA related classes and that are experts in that kind of stuff. So I apologize, I don't know. Okay, from Romeo, when using a portable generator that is not separately derived to supply a residence during a power outage, should the grounding jumper from the neutral to the frame be removed? Question has to do with a generator. You take a portable generator and you're gonna now, let's say, connect it to a premises, and at the premises, the neutral is already connected to the equipment grounding conductor. If you take a portable generator, you don't know if the neutral is connected to the equipment grounding conductor in the generator. If it is connected to the equipment grounding conductor, it's in other words, neutral and grounds are bonded to the generator, and neutral and grounds are bonded at the service. If you take that generator, and ge generators might have GFCI protection because it's now required in six, in 590, having to do a temporary 6590.6, I believe 590.6 of some generators, then the GFCI will, will immediately trip and you'll never be able to get it to work. The work around that is that you'll see the manufacturers of the generators actually have instructions that if you're gonna take this generator, not use it on a job site, but you're gonna connect it to premises, then you need to go into, and they, have, they show you graphics and the diagrams and examples how to do that, is disconnect the neutral to the case bond inside the generator. Because it, it is, Romeo, a separately derived system, obviously, because it's the only power coming in at that given time but we have to make sure that the grounding and bonding is either done at the generator or at the first disconnecting means, and it will be already done at the premises. So yes, Romeo, you want to disconnect the new to the ground bond at the generator when you bring a generator into premises that had a service applied because the neutral is already bonded via the main bonding jumper in compliance with 250.28. Any other questions? I think this referred to an earlier one. Tim Dean had said, so the TAP rules still apply? Well, I'm assuming, Tim, you're talking about the secondary conductor question about whether you need to disconnect from the primary to secondary. And I say you need to disconnect on the primary. That was a new rule, 450.14. You don't need to disconnect on the secondary, but secondary conductors have rules. You just can't run secondary conductors unlimited lengths. These are not called TAP conductors. These are called secondary conductors. And if you go to 25024, sorry, 24021, and I if I use the word tap rules, I was wrong. I said go to the tap rules, and that's kind of like a bad thing. Because there are tap rules in there, and that's 24021B has to do with the tap rules on feeders, but once you get into transformers, then that's not a tap rule, it's a secondary conductor. But 
In the field, we might call them tap conductors, but they're really secondary conductors. So, uh, Belinda, read me that question again. So the tap rules still apply? All I can tell you, Tim, is that the secondary conductors of a transformer are going to have to comply with 250-24-C, 250-250, I'm sorry, I keep saying 250, 240-21-C requirements. They're not tap rules, but you have to comply with those requirements, which require you to terminate inner overcurrent device, which effectively is going to be a disconnect if you want to call it a disconnect. And there's a maximum 10-foot length or a maximum 25-foot length. And even some unlimited lengths if they're going to be outside the building. So there's different possibilities. Any other questions? All right, no questions being remaining here. Question is this. If I have a 10-foot water pipe and it's my grounding electrode, do I have to supplement that water pipe with an additional electrode? And the answer is yes. That's going to be page 114, and that rule is 250.50. And what it says is that if a water pipe is available on the premises, then we're gonna have to use the water pipe as one of our electrodes. And page 116 gives us the requirements of 250.53D2 on the water pipe. And that one says that if you use a water pipe electrode, that you have to supplement the water pipe electrode with another electrode. And traditionally, if you're gonna supplement that, you'd supplement that with a ground rod. So yes, we have to supplement. And the question is, well, why do you have to do that? Well, the, the real reason is because a lot of times a water pipe has been replaced with PVC. As a matter of fact, just this weekend, I was in Ormond Beach and I was looking at a house. And I went around the side of the service and there was this, I think, one inch rigid conduit, the original one inch rigid conduit for that house. And you can see the grounding electric conductors connected to it. And I took a photo of that, a, a picture of that. And you see the whole, it was cut off where it entered the building. I guess at one point they decided oh, too many leaks inside this 80 year old house or 70 year old house. And they must have replaced all the plumbing with copper at some other point. At one time it was steel. So that grounding electric conductor was run through the water pipe at that original time. The water pipe was cut off and of course it's corroded at all. So if you have a water piping system, you have to use that, you have to supplement that with an additional electrode, which is probably gonna be a ground rod. But the code really starting in 2008, and of course continuing in 2011, requires us to use the concrete case electrode if it's going to be available. Like I'm having a house built right now. They put a stem wall, they're still in there. If we didn't get in there before they poured the concrete, one could argue, well, it's not available. No, the argument is that you needed to get in there before they poured the concrete. You have to get to the steel in the foundation or footer in compliance with a concrete and case electrode. So today, you should be using concrete and case electrodes. They are the, the best type of electrode you can possibly use. I'll move on, move on to another question unless another one is presented. You, you do have one. I have a question here. Give me a second, pulling it up. All right, while you guys are working on that, I'll, I'll bring up a, a, a last question here at my end. My son has a high-end cord-connected treadmill installed in a spare bedroom, and it trips his one pole 15 amp AFCI breaker. It trips it out about once every three times when it starts up. Question, what's causing the problem? And number two, if that can't be fixed, is it legal to install a dedicated circuit in a dwelling unit for that specific piece of equipment? All right, let's answer the second question first. Can you run a separate dedicated circuit into a dwelling unit bedroom or anywhere in a dwelling unit at all to plug in a specific piece of equipment that's in bedrooms and dining rooms and in the general living areas? And the answer, without AFCI protection, the answer is no. Okay, but what's causing the problem? The problem has to do with the way high-end equipment starts up. They have, I think they have brush motors in there and they create some kind of interference with AFCIs. The AFCI manufacturers are aware of this. So you need to get a hold of them and, and, and they need to probably adjust their AFCIs to recognize this signature, this arcing signature as not a fault and ultimately it will be taken care of. And I know it doesn't solve your problem because the AFCI trims, you gotta go, and if you're a contractor, you install it with a brand new home with a high-end treadmill, the people don't wanna know anything about this code stuff. They just wanna make sure the treadmill works, and they're they're suspecting that there's something wrong with the wiring because 
I never had a problem with this treadmill in my last house. And it's a difficult sell to try to convince a customer that, listen, I didn't make the device. I just installed it. It's working. The problem is an incompatibility between this technology and that technology. Now, this, this also happens with treadmills. Um, you might get a treadmill and then put it in your house and plug it in and have it on a garage with GFCI and it trips the GFCIs. Again, the same manufacturers are making GFCIs and AFCIs. They are aware of this. And I have heard about a special filter that you plug into the receptacle, then you plug in your treadmill into this special enclosure that has a, you know, that, that has an inlet for the, uh, the you know, a, a receptacle in that thing. And it filters out the signal from the equipment so that it doesn't get over to electronic device. But I, and if anybody's watching this, if you really need that information, get with me and then between both of us, we'll chase it and we'll get the right information. So that's a problem. Richard says, and what are the potential consequences if you don't separate the neutral from the frame ground on the generator? Okay, Richard, you're a practical guy. You're like, come on, Mike, I got a generator. I mean, I don't know if inside the generator neutral is connected to the case. I just want to bring it over there and I want to plug it in. And then what, okay, there's no GFCI on the generator. I'm going to go into the transfer switch. Just what are the consequences if I, if I, if I don't do it correctly. Let me think. Electrically? Nothing. Electrons won't know the difference. It's small little generator, not a large system. And because a neutral is bonded at the generator and the neutral is bonded at the service, you violate the code because you can only bond at one of the two locations. If it was GFCI on the generator, it will trip. So the consequence, if there's GFCI on the generator, it won't work. If there's no GFCI on the generator, there's no safety hazard, but it's a violation of the code. Getting back to the question about the treadmill, it could be, Jay says, it could be possible too, Mike, that the treadmill calls for a dedicated 20A circuit, not a sh shared 15A circuit. Oh, that's a, the question was about this treadmill that maybe a contributing factor to this is that it should have been on a 20 amp circuit and it maybe should have been on a 20 amp dedicated circuit. That is a great, great response. I wish I would have thought that. <laughs> Not a single 15 amp possibly shared circuit. And that's another, well, it won't be a shared circuit because it can't work on an AFCI share. So that's another good point is I had thought about that. Get the instructions for the treadmill, go online if the customer doesn't have it, find out what size circuit is required, and if they have a 15 amp circuit, then that could be a contributing factor. But I have heard about AFCI stripping with treadmills having to do with the interference with, with the, the startup. Rick asks, is there any requirement that a concrete encased electrode must be turned off directly under service? I've never had a concrete installer turn the rebar up where the service is to be installed yet. All right, well, my concrete encased electrode that you have to go to rebar, you have to use fittings that are listed 250.70 specifically for direct burial, and it has to, come, has to be listed for that material, and it has to be listed for that rebar, it has to be listed for direct burial, and all those things. Can I just bend the rebar? Hey, listen, can you give me a piece of rebar out of the ground? That's a building code question, because the building code says that rebar cannot be exposed. So what you're going to have to do is you're really going to have to run a conductor. Well, what you could do is have them stub it up and put it into the chase of a block wall, but they're going to have to encapsulate it somehow. So the key is that's a building code issue that's not an electrical code issue. Well, how am I doing it in my house? I'm running a four gauge wire with a proper terminal on the concrete and case electrode, the rebar. And I'm not going to try to get rebar again stubbed out. Because I know what's going to happen to the rebar. The rebar is going to corrode. It's going to rust. It is going to. It is going to. Well, then you can't use that. Are we done? Tim says the local AHJ required four zero on new service. He's saying that the inspector requires four aught. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, Tim, if you're saying four aught to the concrete and case electrode or if you're referring to something else, but four gauge. Not A W. It's just four A W G, not four up. Four. Okay. Yeah. It's not four up. Four. Now I can't tell you what somebody might require, but that's not what we're talking about. These are personal issues. You know what I mean? We can't get into personal issues. This is talking code. Not what some person might be thinking that I don't know. All right. Um, how long are we supposed to run this show? Because I think we're saying we're going thirty minutes. What was our what was our what did we say we were doing? 
We don't know. So we got to find out here, and then we're going to make sure that we can find... We were 45. 45 minutes. All right. And we'll take in the questions as we go along. All right. Um, a question came up, probably one of the viewers, and I'm not quite sure I understand this, so you might kind of clarify it. What's the specific rule on using a grounding conductor as a neutral conductor in a control circuit of a 120 volt control? Well, if you have a control circuit, there is no neutral because you only have two wires. And one of those is gonna be a grounding conductor and one of those can be a hot wire. It doesn't really matter of a transformer which is gonna be one or the other, but you're gonna connect one over to the case of the transformer for the control. And then you're gonna use that conductor also to supply your control circuit, um, your 120 volt control. So grounding conductor uses a neutral conductor control circuit. Maybe the question is I'm putting a 120 volt transformer in a 240 volt application and I need a neutral for that 120 volt transformer and can I use the equipment grounding conductor for the neutral? If that is the question, I'm now reading it now, I'm suspecting that is the question, a 120 volt transformer connected to a 240 volt circuit trying to get 120 volt controls can i connect use one of those conductors that's a neutral not really a neutral but the grounding conductor can i can i connect it to the equipment grounding conductor and the answer is no what rule is that that's 250.142 also 250.6 having to do with objectionable current you cannot use the equipment grounding conductor as a current carrying conductor, 250.142, except at the service, because look at your neutral at the service. You're able to use your neutral as your equipment grounding conductor. Any other questions? You know what, um, those of you that are watching the video, if you can help me out here, we know we have some technical problems. You can't see my computer screen. My audio is not operating. <laughs> the bandwidth, we couldn't change the bandwidth quick enough. And we had a problem with the equipment dropping out. The laptop got toasted here. So this is been <laughs> before we went live. All of this, like about 15 minutes before we went live. So uh, Brian Birch, who handles our, our multimedia and our social networking stuff, is going crazy. And he's, he's a little frustrated it's happened this way. So the next program, we're going to make it better. So we recognize these issues already. But is there something else that you can suggest to us? Just jump in right now and tell us what you'd like to see. Is there a certain time of the day? Should we do something in the evening? Should we get out of Facebook and maybe just simply do this a webcast? Do you have any other experience with any other um, seminars you've done online that you can give us some feedback on? So just kind of give us that information so that we know. They've been giving a lot of nice feedback, saying this has been amazing. Thank you so much. So they're enjoying. Oh, that's another good question. Are you guys enjoying this? Is this a value to you? Okay. Well, we'll get that feedback. Um, question have to do with general lighting loads. And the difference between the calculating of a service with a general lighting load compared to the IECC table 505.5.2 interior lighting. I guess in the building code, they have requirements on lighting and then you have the electrical code that has electrical calculations requirements for lighting. And apparently that if you use the NEC requirements for lighting, it far exceeds the lighting requirements that the building code has, especially with energy efficiency. And it's like, well, what's going on between the two? Hey, listen, I don't know anything about the building code. You want to get electrical inspection, buddy? You want to get a permit? Then you need to go to the National Code and do all your calculations. And that's just the way it works out. Whether, whether the building code um, realities will at, migrate into the National Code someday in the future, I don't know. But right now, yes. If you use the NEC calculations, are those calculations required to have a much bigger service than required? The answer is yes. You can take a typical house. A 200 amp service in a house, put an amp meter on it. You guys that have been electricians, you know what I'm talking about. Put an amp meter on a 200 amp service. I would be surprised if you ever drew more than 50 amps, ever. That's just the way it works out. And it's kind of good because you have a lot of room for expansion. But so yes, building code rules will be different than electrical, but for electrical, we have to comply with the electrical requirements. Alan says more than one circuit to a detached garage would require a ground rod at the garage. A sub panel in a detached garage does require a ground rod and EGC. Okay, read that question again. More than one circuit to a detached garage would require a ground rod at the garage. Hold on a second. Okay, if you go to 250.32a, that rule says that anytime you run more than one circuit, now, 
Who, who asked the question? Is that Tim? Alan did. Alan. Alan. Anytime you have more than one circuit. Now, two hots and a neutral, that is a multi-wire brain circuit. That is one circuit. So if you run more than one circuit, then you would have to have a grounding electrode conductor run to a grounding electrode. That is true. So run two hots and a neutral on a multi-wire brand circuit, put a common trip breaker at the panel, go to a detached garage, no grounding electrode conductor or grounding is required. The second part of the question was? A sub-panel in a detached garage does require a ground rod and EGC. Okay. Well, if you're going to be running more than one circuit, you're saying, well, the only way you're going to do that is you're going to be running a feeder. And then because you're running a feeder, 250.32A tells you, well, it's not a brand circuit, right? It's a feeder. Anytime you run a feeder to a building, that building is going to have to have a disconnected means in compliance with 225.30 through 36. You need to disconnect. Then you're going to have to have a grounding electrode system and a grounding electric conductor in compliance with 250.32A. Anything else? No, at this time. Um, one of the gentlemen asked about PV systems. My PV systems are being installed now in older homes, and these houses have code violations because the, the code at the time that was installed is not the code today. What do we do if there's already code violations on the premises and they're running a PV system, and I'm not sure what to do. Anytime you install anything that is new, you have to install it in accordance to the current standard. So whatever is there, if it's wrong, and you can see that it's wrong next to whatever, but you're not touching that, well, that doesn't require, you don't have to touch that and, and bring it up to any code. The NEC is not retroactive. The NEC just simply says that when you are installing equipment, that it has to be installed in compliance with the code at the time the code is adopted. Yes? Jay says the NEC handbook commentary even addresses this that energy saving calculations cannot be used when calculating just jumped on me. When calculating the general lighting load. Okay, and that was who said that? Jay had said that. Alright, Jay, so you were just jumping in there that the handbook, which I don't have with me, it they're they're even addressing this. Hey, listen guys, you know, this is our calculations for service conductor sizing, even though energy efficiency somewhere else, but we can't address that. And that was covered in the NAC handbook commentary. All right, Jay. And Rick does say Facebook Live video is much easier than flying to Florida. Posting the webcast will help for any conflict in scheduling things. All right. So here we go. Um, Tim says, would a ground rod be required if four wires installed to remote garage panel? That's a great question, Tim. For many, many years, and it still happens today, people think that if you ran PVC and you take an equipment grounding conductor out to that remote building, then a grounding electrode is not required. That has never been the rule, ever. 250.32 deals with the grounding and bonding at remote buildings and structures. It has always required a grounding electrode conductor and a grounding electrode system anytime you have more than a single branch circuit. So if you bring an equipment grounding conductor, as a matter of fact, you are required to bring an equipment grounding conductor to the remote building. That was a proposal that I made in 2008 to remove the permission that allows you to use a neutral for equipment grounding. So you have to bring four wires, and that was my proposal in 2008, period. And you have to have a grounding electroconductor run to a grounding electrode system. So. Don't think that an equipment grounding, see an equipment grounding conducts to carry fall current. The grounding is to be able to, to discharge energy. Totally two different applications. Another question that came up, and I think we're just about done. I have a data center, and I found it difficult to determine what the code requirements are for cable sizing and protection relative to wet cell battery system serving a large UPS system. I do not know anything about conductor sizing and protection for batteries for a large UPS system. So what do you do when me, supposedly an expert, has no knowledge? Go to MikeHolt.com. This is really important. Go to the code form. And in the code form, you post your question. And a lot of these questions might be posted under an engineering section. Or it could be under the code section or lightning or surge protection. Or it could be listed under grounding and bonding. There are a lot of different subcategories in there. And just a little note that Belinda sent me the other day. We've had over one million posts 
on our code form since we started. We are the number one rated forum when it comes to electrical power, as well as the number one rated website as it comes to electrical power in the world. We hope our website's been useful to you. I think we've been running now a little bit more than 45 minutes. I'm gonna close it up, but if there's any questions that come up before I close it up, I'm gonna take all the questions that come in and I'll answer those. We also wanted to say thank you to ECNM. Oh, yes, those of you guys from ECNM Magazine, I love ECNM Magazine. I've been with ECNM since 1980, so that's what, 32 years. I've been writing for ECNM and traveling and doing work with ECNM Magazine, and they're, they're a special relationship. And those of you guys that are with ECNM, I'm sure you see my writings in the magazine. Um, we want to thank Mike Eby. He's my buddy, he's my boss, and uh, we really appreciate that. All right, any last questions before we close? And this is your last chance, guys. Do it now. A PD system will connect to the existing GES. If the GES is not compliant to present code, is it not a violation to connect to it? The question is this. That was the one about, I'm installing a PV system in the existing building if the current grounding electrode system is not current to the code, and the PV system is connected to that, do I have to then have the, the current grounding electrode system compliant? The answer, well, yeah. The PV system has to be connected to a grounding electrode, and so you put in a, a grounding electrode that it complies with, and then you kind of tie the two together, or you upgrade the original AC grounding electrode system. So yeah, you have to have a proper grounding electrode system for a PV system. That was the last one we had. All right, last one we have there, boys and girls. And I hope that you find it valuable. I apologize for the technical difficulties and maybe some of the background noise, and we'll, we'll make that better. God bless. Have a great day, guys. Thanks for joining us. All right, thank you.